a badge of honor. Police officers and first responders wear badges to let their communities know they are here to protect and serve. But that's not how it feels today. And the stress of the job is taking its toll, picking lives through suicide and post-traumatic stress injury. A Badge of Honor podcast features the cast of the same name, Sam Horwitz and John Salerno. Sam, John, and the team offer the first responders workshops through their critical incident stress management teams and mental health liaisons to offer state-certified t Cole credit programs that save lives. It's time to smash through the stigma. It's time to heal from your injury, and it's time to back our blue. Welcome to a Badge of Honor podcast. Here are your hosts, Sam Horowitz and John Salerno. Hey, welcome to the Badge of Honor podcast. Still learning our new routine since we changed names from Mad Radio to a Badge of Honor podcast. So this way we can bring our 501c3 and our foundation, integrate it with our podcast so no one gets confused. We don't want to have anybody left behind. We want to make sure that everybody has the right channels to get the help they need. I want to welcome my co-host, Sam. How are you doing, Sam? Hey, doing great. And remember, a Badge of Honor podcast is every Monday right at this time. We're driving home with you, powered by the Offbeat Business or OBBM Media Network. John, it is awesome to be with you. It's not such an awesome month, you know. Uh, we are in September all month long. We are talking the tough subject of suicide. It's Suicide Prevention Month, but it always seems that we've got suicide from, you know, veterans or first responders. It, I don't, it may just be me or maybe folks are highlighting it more, but this month is tough. You know, uh, when you say how tough it is, um, September is Suicide Awareness Month, right? And prevention and just, month, yeah. Prevention month, and and just here at home, my personal issues, um, lost two two to suicide, uh, two close friends, and uh, and a, you know a, a an army veteran who I was working with for a long time and battling Brian, uh, he he he's been battling for a long time, and uh, he, you know, the demons just got the best of him. Uh, he tried and tried, tried different things, it just didn't work. And, um, he ended up taking his life, uh, this past week. And then, you know, somebody from, uh, Chicago who does one of the British captains, Rebecca from, um, Chicago reached out to me and she lost a veteran to suicide as well. The same week. It's, um, you know, when we talk about suicide and we talk about the stigma and smashing it and the battles that, uh, occur, you know, we got to look at the coping mechanisms behind it. We got to look at what what our loved ones, our friends, our families, um, how they change. We have to be able to recognize the flags. When we turn around and say, you know, like we say it all the time, Sam, I go, "Are you okay?" And you're like, "Yeah, I'm fine." And I know you're lying, right? right. Or I know I know you're you know you're not okay. Um, I end up taking that for face value and going, "Okay, she says she's okay." And then I walk away. But we have to really learn that uncomfortable follow-up question where we have to sit down and we really have to dig deep um, as friends and family and, and loved ones and coworkers. We have to be able to say, you know what, Bo, you're not okay. We're here to help. Be there. You got to be, if you start being vulnerable and opening up and being transparent to a suffering, maybe you'll start reeling them in a little bit and maybe uh, that may help. Um, and today's show brings it right on board because I don't think there's anybody who's interviewed more um, first responders with post-traumatic stress um, in the last few years than, you know, psychiatrists, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Yeah. And it's it's not only about smashing the, the stigma surrounding mental health, not just post-traumatic stress, right. um, but it's about bridging the gap and having the willingness and the openness to have the tough conversations. And so I want, we let's bring on our guest from uh, PTSD 911 movie, which will premiere uh, in November. We have the producer, director, Conrad Weaver with us. Conrad, 
Welcome to a Badge of Honor podcast. How are you doing tonight? Hey, it's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Welcome, you are so welcome. Yeah, you have been, well, this has been a project born uh, out of awareness and love. Um, why don't you tell everybody listening and watching um, how this project popped into your head and why you <laughs> said, I need to make this? Yeah, so about four years ago, I was sitting in a patrol car in the front seat <laughs> on a ride along. <laughs> there you I, go. I want to clarify that. <laughs> I was on a ride along working on a film about the opioid crisis, and we were called to a fatal overdose scene. And I went into that scene as a civilian, not really having seen something like that before. And that afternoon, I drove home trying to figure out what that I experienced. And then I started thinking about the first responders who were on scene. And that led me to starting to research, okay, how does trauma affect first responders? How do these things that first responders see and experience on, on the regular, you know, how does it affect them? And I uncovered this whole problem of PTSD, of, of PTS, PTSI with first responders. And then I researched, okay, who else is telling the story? And at the time, you know, three and a half years ago, there was very little being said or done about this on a feature length documentary level. And I thought, you know what, this is an important subject. I love first responders. I love how they take care of us. They respond to our worst day and they keep doing it over and over again. And it's about time we reach back to take care of them. And so that's really what we hope to accomplish with this film is to raise awareness of of this is what first responders really face. And I think most civilians don't really understand that. And you know, Conrad, looking at the trailer of the movie, um, you know, the officer in the very beginning of the trailer, you could see the pain that she is suffering. And so many of our first responders suffer in silence, right? Absolutely. Because, you know, I almost wore my Batman t-shirt today because <laughs> I wanted to display, you know, this is just this logo is not who we are. You know, we're not Superman. We're not Batman. We're not these superheroes. We're human beings who have, you know, um, feelings and, and and hurt and stress. And we don't we're never taught. We know we we're taught how to shoot. We're taught how to fight. We're taught all these investigative skills. But we're not taught on how to handle our internal mm -hmm. stress and coping mechanisms when it, when it becomes overload. Now, you have interviewed probably thousands of first responders on on this um, mm. project. Is there a common denominator that you see in, in some of them or some are closed up? You know, I think one of the common denominators is this exactly what you said, is that most first responders, you know, from what I've met, you know, are type A, are driven, are motivated, are competitive. They have the big S on their chest, right? and they consider themselves as superheroes and in fact i had a firefighter that uh, he's a captain and i interviewed him and he went down you know a very dark road and he said you know we think we are superheroes but we're actually not and he said that is one of the problems that we have is that we think that these things are invincible in fact i interviewed another officer actually in your local community there who said and he's a detective he's been on the force for 30 years he said I didn't think this stuff was real. I didn't think PTS was real. And why would it, you know, I'm a tough guy. I can handle it. You know, the, you know, the, the stuff that affects people, it's for the weak minded it, until it affected him, you know? And well, I think that that's the problem that we have is that it can affect everybody. And if you walk around with an S on your chest, thinking that you're invincible, you're going to fall. Now we, when you just hit on another topic that sparked something in my head was firefighters and police, right? Back in the 60s and the 70s, we looked at post-traumatic stress as only veteran-based, right? right? We never really looked at it as a first responder issue. It was all, bat, uh, you know, battle fatigue or shell shock or anything like, you know, those those names. But then we look at the police, and now the police are highlighted with post-traumatic stress because of every all the traumas they go through. Firefighters, you know, they go through the same exact thing, but not they're not as highlighted same with 9-11 dispatchers, correction officers. They're not as highlighted, but they go through the same exact stresses. Do you see a difference in the conversation between firefighters, police, 9-11 uh, dispatchers, and corrections? Do you see like a, a different format of 
I, I see it. The only difference I really see is how it affects them. And because, you know, a, an officer, a police officer responds to a call and he or she takes maybe 30 to an hour or two hours to deal with that call. And then it may be 30, 40 minutes before the next thing comes in. And so they have time to a little bit of time to decompress uh, from a from a, you know, an incident, whereas uh, in, in the fire service, they it's similar they get some time to decompress but their issue is they go back say they're on the night shift and they're sleeping and so now they gotta they have this adrenaline pumping mission that they're on they go back they try to get to sleep they can't sleep because they have all this adrenaline pumping through them and then the tones go off again or they go to sleep you know and they're sleeping for two hours but they know that the tones could go off any time. And so they're really not getting that deep REM sleep, that REM sleep that they really need to really reprogram their brain. Right. 911 dispatchers, they get it back to back to back to back with no break. Right. They get the call, they hang out. In fact, the dispatcher on, in my film says, you know, my first two calls I got when I was a dispatcher were back to back. I hung up the first call, boom, the phone rang again, and it was another call. And she said, that's what started me on this road that, you know, we don't get a break from it. And, and, and so those are, they're all affected by post-traumatic stress and by the traumas that they face, but they have maybe different ways of, of getting there. Absolutely. And speaking of breaks, we have got to take our first break uh, to hear from one of our sponsors who backs the blues. Stay tuned, everybody. Be right back. What is the role of American government anyway? Is the role of government to decide where I can go and where I can't? Is the role of government to work tirelessly to destroy vital infrastructure that keeps goods and services from my customers? Is the role of government to choose who can drive, fly, or ride according to mandated stipulations that threaten my body, health, mind, and conscience? Without medical freedom legislation in place, our rights and freedoms are one vote away from being dissolved. Individually, change is improbable, but as an aggregate, attainable, it's time to act with one voice. My voice. And my voice. And my voice. And my voice. To protect our freedom, creating one voice that cannot be ignored. This requires your voice, too. Your voice, your feet, your vote, not just at the ballot box, but training to be a poll watcher, precinct chair, judge, or early ballot counter, so you are doing all you can to protect the fairly counted American vote. Move Freely America. Go to movefreelyamerica.org to find a chapter near you. Plug in, donate, and help our legislators defend our God-given rights under the Constitution. Move Freely America. Because my voice and my voice, together with your voice, we're one voice that cannot be ignored. Donate today. MoveFreelyAmerica.org. And we are back, everybody, with Conrad Weaver, PTSD 911 movie. Hey, we're talking about a really uh, serious topic, which is post traumatic stress that affects our first responders. And Conrad, you just laid out perfectly how uh, the job affects our. Police, our firefighters, and our uh, 911 communicators very differently because the roles, the jobs are different. And I think one of the things that as John and I and the team at A Badge of Honor were out there doing our workshops, when we talk to the 911 communicators, they're in the room with firefighters, with uh, police officers and other first responders, like a giant melting pot, you see this aha moment come on where it's like, oh my gosh, the police and fire never really understood what the dispatch is going through. And then they're like, oh, well, that makes sense. And then dispatch on the other side is like, well, if you guys would just tell us what happened, we could go home and sleep at night. <laughs> because the biggest thing... Yep. I think we lost you, Sam. Yeah, you know, I think the dispatchers, what... if you will, is uh, is the fact. Yeah, the, the biggest thing for the 911 dispatchers is that um, there's no closure. Right. So they're answering the phone. They're they're dispatching the first responders to the call. And then Conrad, like you said, they're going on to the next the, yep. the next call. There's no closure. And I think. What your movie does 
highlight the serious nature and why we have to talk about this and why departments need to, I'll say it, cut the crap, take care of each other because we are of one like mind. We are all service providers to our community and post-traumatic stress is real. It affects us in different ways. Some of us do have uh, we feel like we do have that S. Our resiliency uh, levels are higher. Have Did you, so we're able to deal with more. Did you have conversations about wellness and resi resiliency in the interviews that you did? Absolutely. That's uh, that's one of the themes that we're talking about. In fact, we're working with a number of uh, people, psychologists and psychiatrists who we're working with, as well as leaders in in the first responder communities who talk about wellness, who talk about a focus of wellness uh, that is so important. And what we need is really leaders to step up to begin to understand this. And for us, you know, for so many years, for decades, we've had leaders that have said, you know, rub some dirt on it. And, you know, here's a beer. And we've seen where, you know, where that has taken us. And so what we need is now is leaders that understand these things that are willing to say, you know what, we made some mistakes in the past we have not handled these things correctly. We want to make changes. And that takes that takes some some balls. It takes right. some initiative and it takes money. And right. we have to convince the even the the, you know, the bean counters from the city who are holding the funds to make uh, make some changes. And I think there's a way to do that. And we're going to showcase some of these agencies who have actually done that. And so we're really excited to to present those those case studies of agencies that have said yes. And it doesn't have to be that expensive to make some small changes that can make a huge difference. I like that. Uh, and what, like are, that. what are some changes? But, you know, you, when you say it doesn't take a lot of money, we obviously know that budget is involved. Absolutely. Um, what what are some of the changes that that excite you you the most? I think, you know, one that I've seen, and I don't want to go into a whole lot because I want people to watch the movie, but sure. one is, you know, for law enforcement, for example. In fact, my neighbor across the street is a, is a sheriff's deputy. And I asked him a while back, do you guys get to work out on the job? Do you have a gym? Well, yeah, we have a small gym, but no one really uses it. And, you know, we don't have time to go work out. Well, there's a, there's a couple agencies that I know of who have gym, gyms built into their into their police station and the one agency that we're featuring they, they say you have an hour and a half of your 12-hour shift to go work out we wow. expect you to do that we expect you to come in take your uniform off change into some workout clothes work out that call you just had get out get out there you know sweat a little bit do some exercises put your uniform you know, take a shower put your uniform back on go back on the street that's a huge shift in in how we handle these kind of things. And I think that can give an officer who may not have, a, who, he, I mean, he may live or she may live an hour out of town, has a big commute. Now they're doing a 12 hour shift, that they have a family at home. They don't have time to work out, but now if they're given a chance to work out on the job and to get a quality workout in, their whole lifestyle is going to improve and their health is going to improve because of that. I, I, I'm just going to, I'm just going gonna, gonna, to, I love that idea. And when I was on in the NYPD, we had a gym, right? And a, lo a lot of the, the guys would use it, right? But here's the issue. And um, and California, I think, does it right. The California firefighters do it right. It's not working out while you're working on tour, like when you have your tour, right? Give the guys an hour and a half pay before and an, or an hour and a half pay after their shift. Because what happens is if a guy has a rough morning, right, and he's got an hour or an hour and a half to decompress, he's going to go sit in the lounge, have a cup of coffee, and kick back and just try to de-stress. He may not want to work out, get all sweaty, get back in his uniform, put all that weight back on, and get back out. Pay the guys an hour prior for workout and an hour after. This way, if they work out an hour after work, now all those chemicals are flowing when they get home, by the time they get home, they're a little bit more relaxed. Mm -hmm. 
they're working out the whole day stress. You work out midday, and then you have three shootings, uh, suicide, and a, and a choking baby. Guess what? All that stress is right back. You bring it back home again. I think it. I think it depends on on a couple of factors, like what what how your life was organized prior to the job, or like the commitments that you make. I, I, John, it makes perfect sense. Um, I think maybe it's called differential or something like that because we it, it used to be you know you'd have an eight hour day or ten hour day, but then you'd have this extra time. You were still on, on the clock, and you were being paid to take care of your wellness and and um it is a it is a while it sounds simple to institute it really you know you guys know we've all been in government yeah. work <laughs> you gotta you gotta strip back the layers of the onion and really carve out what it takes to have a healthy department and John, you and I have said this before, when health, wellness, resiliency, mental health, whatever you want to call it is below the paper clips, you know, that's the kind of thing that gets submitted to the city or, or whomever you're asking the money from. And it's like, oh, you only need that. Yeah, we can do that. Where it's like, make the big, we encourage, make the big ask up front, make the argument for your folks, because when they see that, right? You're making the argument for your folks. They see it. The city sees it. You may not get everything, but at least your folks know that you're looking out for their best interests because we've got still such a question mark. And I I think the movie is going to clear up so much. Uh, for those of you guys that are watching on the bottom of the screen, you can see I've got the the um, link up ptsd911movie.com. That's ptsd911movie.com. And you guys can go there and read more about the why behind it, the how you guys uh, went about it, and uh, everything else um, surrounding that. And so I want to take a, we've got to take another quick break, but when we come back, we will, we will pick up and talk about why we need to back uh, each other. So we're going to take a quick break. Be right back. Interested in starting a podcast or TV show? Worried about what you'll say and how to keep it engaging? Think you'd like to be a guest on podcast, radio, or TV shows? Hi, I'm Susan Hamilton, owner and founder of OBBM Network, and I would like to invite you to an OBBM media training to get the tools you need for a relaxed and polished performance you'll be proud to share. Our specialized training techniques include role play, voice training, and everything you need to deliver a confident, clear, and engaging interaction. Go to offbeatbusiness.com. Go to the calendar and register for a training that's convenient for you. Dates available now, 214-714-0495. Welcome back. Uh, Conrad, I do have a, um, a question I do have to ask you. Before we went for break, I, ha I had it in my mind. When we're talking about the stigma, we're talking about the interviews that you did. We get a lot, um, and especially what happened in uh, Uvalde, you know, uh, right here in Texas not too long ago, um, a, a police force of 12 members, right? Oh, 12 member police force, they are affected by post-traumatic stress or these smaller departments. Now, big and large, you and you got to interview all of these uh, first responders, either a volunteer fire department, a smaller department, small, you know, uh, 15 runs a day or one run a day. Post-traumatic stress hits everybody, no matter what it is, no matter what department you're with. Did you see um, a difference between the bigger departments and the smaller departments or the community departments? No, there's really no difference in post-traumatic stress. I mean, a smaller department may not have some of the bigger uh, or more frequent uh, issues that uh, a large city department has. And, but for example, one of the, one of the police departments I'm working with is a Pinole police department in Pinole, California. They, they have 28 sworn officers. So a fairly small department, you know, a, a, you know, compared to another department that we work with that's in, in Garland, just near you guys, uh, Garland, Texas, they have over 300 sworn officers. And so huge difference in those numbers. 
but they have the same issues. They have right. the same challenges and they see the same types of, you know, stressors that, that they have. I mean, and, and these days everybody's talking about the big issue in the room is, is just availability of people, of bodies to, to put them, you know, uh, you know, staffing is a huge issue. In fact, the FOP did a survey last year. And I think the number one stressor for law enforcement right now is staffing. That's the number one stressor across the nation in, in law enforcement. And so if you are working more hours because you're mandatory to held over, then the stress level is going to come up because you have less rest. You are spending less time with your family. You, you know, are working more. So you're more tired. Uh, you know, so that just adds up. And so that can add up to more post-traumatic stress uh, in your life. And so those kind of things, you know, there's no difference whether it's a large agency or a small agency. And even even the volunteer, I mean, I live in Emmitsburg, Maryland, the home of the National Fire Academy and the, the National Emergency Training Center. Our firehouse here is volunteer. We have a couple of full-time uh, uh, EMTs who service the ambulances, but all the fire companies, it's all volunteer. In fact, they went out on a call about an hour and a half ago to a big house fire. And so these guys face the same types of things that a full on city department has. Um, and so right. there's really not that much difference. Yeah. And That's that goes to what house. I was saying to support, right? Well, right before we took a, took a break, it's going, it's recognizing the things that are needed, but how do I best support my troops? Okay, that, so, that should be that should be the question that every uh, command staff is asking. And um, it's not being asked. And we see that John, the, the NYPD officer who completed suicide and that whole article. And I still think about the officer um, that was quoted in that article saying, um, they, they, they were talking about the stress um, with, with the layoffs, with the, the um, number of officers that are leaving NYPD and having to work more. And an officer saying, well, that's not a reason to kill yourself. And it's like, whoa, you know, that like was a slap in the face. Um, John and I both worked in, in, in New York City and it's like, Post-traumatic stress affects people differently. And when we have our own making comments like that, it's like, A, you weren't paying attention. And B, there's no support. But see, on that, on that note, on that note, I was I was livid about that quote. And I was so pissed off that officer for making that quote. But you know what? I had to forgive him. You know why? Because he's uneducated because of the department. The department, an educated person on post traumatic stress, somebody that's up on it and knows the signs and symptoms, would have not answered that way. That just shows, but that just shows the uneducation. It's not, a, it's not the officer's fault that he, he said that. It's all he knows, it's what he was brought up learning. So we see that. We see, you know, that, that officer right there should be our stepping stone to say on what not to do. And it should be a, a, a red flag for the departments going, Hey, we better teach our officers more. We have to educate them more on post-traumatic stress. Well, so, I think they need to have front row seats to uh, the premier of PTSD 911 so that they can understand. Um, let's, uh, you know, Conrad, where, where is the movie when and where? Yeah, so we are right now, as I speak, I'm, I'm standing right here in my editing bay and we are I've been editing madly for the past number of weeks and have a long way to go. But we are premiering the film on November 3rd in Irving, Texas, at the Irving Arts Center at the theater there. And we are so excited to partner with NAMI North Texas. They are hosting the film and they, we're working with them to put this thing on. And tonight. Drum roll, please. We have a presenting sponsor for our premiere. Lighthouse Health and Wellness is our presenting sponsor for the premiere 
in, in Irving, Texas. That is so awesome. We're really excited to announce that. Thank you. They are they have have come on board to to help promote this, and we're also we have uh, got some some uh, uh, sponsorship funds from uh, from an attorney, Lisa Hule, in uh, in L.A. She has come on as a sponsor as well. Uh, uh, NAMI Texas is putting some money onto this premiere as well. So we're really excited to have all these people coming together to put together an amazing event. And so uh, I want to say that if you are in the Dallas metro area and you want to come to the premiere, uh, next Monday we will be releasing tickets to the general public that you will be able to uh, secure through our website, uh, through NAMI North Texas. They're going to be hosting that, but uh, you'll be able to go to our website and get tickets for the premiere, and so uh, we'll we'll post that out there whenever they are ready to go. So well, definitely uh, let us know so we can get all over that uh, for you guys that are watching. You can yeah. see the website uh, is at the bottom of the screen for you guys listening. PTSD nine one one movie dot com. Again, don't forget that all important movie uh, word after PTSD. 911. Uh, Conrad, some amazing sponsors and, and partners in on making this happen. You've been at this project for how long? I've been working on it since uh, about the spring of 2019. So, I mean, 2000, no, 2019. What am I saying? Yes. 2019. What is, what is yeah, 2019. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, three, about three years. So, I've been well, working that- on it for three years. That poses a question for me, okay? Because you started working on this Mm pre-COVID, right? Yes. And then you and you're continually working through COVID and after COVID. What's the uptick? Well, COVID threw a whole wrench in everything, right? (laughs) And for all of us in many ways, but I think especially for first responders, uh, you know, one of the issues that the firefighter who's in my film. Uh, you know, faced in his wellness journey when he kind of went through some ups and downs. And when COVID hit, he was put on a COVID task force. So he and one other firefighter paramedic were the only two guys responding to all the COVID calls in the city of Anaheim, California. And wow. he said, oh, wow. you should, you should have seen, I mean, the, the effect that that had on him was significant. And I think the effect that COVID had on, especially our our EMTs, our paramedics, our firefighters was really, really significant. I mean, obviously law enforcement as well, but especially those uh, medical people who had to suit up yep. and all that every time they went into any, any time someone was having breathing difficulties, oh, it might be COVID, suit up, you right. know? And right. so it just, right. the, the stress level just went way up. And for me personally, for the film, it was kind of a mixed blessing because I got into this, you know, we, we always try to raise money and try to try to make connections. And so that produced a challenge. However, all my other projects went away. I was I was doing events for my my film Heroin Script. We had events booked in Las Vegas and in Florida and other places. All those canceled. But what that did for me was freed me up to build relationships for this film. And I think it was a mixed blessing, really, because I was able to do that for that year when we were all kind of hunkering down. Well, everything happens for a reason and happens the way they're supposed to happen. Let's uh, I think now is a perfect time. Let's take a look at the film. All right. Let's go. Here we go. I went to a really dark place in my mind where suicide became an option. I was going through a divorce. I had lost a lot of relationships with people and I wasn't, I was isolating. While I was trying to heal from the traumas that had put me in the position that I was in, I suddenly lost all the support of all the guys I worked with. Yeah, shots fired. Shots fired, I'm about to rip. Study him up, study him up. I felt guilty that, that he died. About 15 minutes in, I'm just listening, and all you can hear is just people screaming. I was only two years into my career with Boston at this point. I was so hypervigilant, and and I couldn't shut my brain off. They told me that I had PTSD, and that they would give me some pills that would basically remove me from my feelings. 
First responders are the toughest of the tough. They're the strongest of the strong, the most resilient people in our society. And they heroically sign up for these very, very difficult jobs in which as a society, we outsource all of our trauma to them. I remember the moment I was like, okay, I was up all night. It was just trauma after trauma after trauma. You know, the novelty of the job wore off really quick. I couldn't think of how to get help without ruining my job. There's a stigma in the profession that creates a barrier, a stigma in their agencies that prevents them from getting the help they need. I didn't have somebody to talk to. I didn't have somebody that understood. There was a part of me that said, okay, pick up the phone, call this person. This is how you're gonna get yourself out of this skillfully and safely. I look back at that period of my life and, and I just felt so completely, utterly isolated. Now my ego wants to stop me from doing that. It wants to tell me, um, you got this. You don't need to let anybody know that this is going on. And that's why I didn't know where to turn. And I didn't, I beat myself up because I thought I am such a mess and I'm the only one. I have four years till retirement and I gotta be okay and I gotta make it. Right now our profession is, is being challenged. We're going through a really, really difficult season. Uh, there's no time like the present where officer wellness has to be your number one priority. We have to do a better job as leadership in our profession to understand that, that that is what we're dealing with people. And I think it's really important that that is our number one resource and that it has to be our number one priority at moving forward if we want to change this profession. We're just coming into our second year now of really teaching structured training in wellness, mental health to the um, firefighter academy. Okay, I'm open to trying something different. If you told me, me four years ago or three years ago I was doing yoga, I'd have laughed in your face. If I can plant seeds throughout the state of wellness, we'll get out there and start permeating and changing the culture. And it's so much better when you have really amazing people in your life that you can walk through this stuff with. You don't have to do it alone. I got to tell you, I'm... Jo can you hear me? Yes. Oh, <laughs> I'm tearing up. That that just a trailer of that really impacts. When we're having this conversation, really impacts because you could see the different the different people from the firehouses and police departments and EMS and 911. The struggles that they're having is so emotional. You know, they're crying for help, and the one officer who says she's got four years. And she hopes she makes it, right? But what happens after those four years? Now, I'm scared. She's alone. You know, after you retire, you lose that connection. You may keep the one or two friends, but you, or maybe five, but you lose that con that brotherhood connection sometimes. If you don't jump back into something real quick, and like I said, Sam, all the time, you're on the couch eating bonbons, watching Judge Judy. That's not the place for you to be. But we we have to have resiliency and wellness programs after retirement. You know, I'm putting I'm I'm drafting a uh, I'm drafting a um a doc a document to bring to the state that um first responders after will get 10 years free medical uh mental health care. Um because a lot of a lot of our our, our or people do not get the medical health care that they need. They have to go to EAP or somebody doesn't. We, we need free medical mental health care after retirement for our first responders. Because that's when they battle a lot. We lose a lot of our, our people, same with our veterans, when they lose that connection. I mean, if you, you, you think about it, the average lifespan for a police officer, I think, is 62. Well, it's, they usually say five years after yeah. retirement. So that's a shame. That's absolutely a shame. And that needs to change. And that's and we know. Yeah, we know what the, what the issues are. It's this it's no longer a mystery, right? We've got the studies that are more than a decade long. They know what is killing us mm -hmm. after retirement. And then again, it goes back to how can we be proactive? Because 
we're always reacting to everything, right? That's how, that's how we're trained. We're reacting to the call for a insert yeah. in the blank, yeah. right? You know, one and, of the things uh, that, one, and, of the, one of the themes that's coming through this film that you'll see in the film is, is, is the phrase, a culture of wellness. And that's what it really takes. It takes a culture of wellness within an agency that permeates every part of that agency. And we, we were so happy to highlight some of those in our film that this is, these are agencies that have developed this. They're not perfect. They're still making, they're still figuring things out. In fact, they, in fact, the one chief told me, he said, yeah, we're not there yet, but we're moving in that direction. We want to have a culture that permeate that wellness permeates everything we do. And so we'll we'll show how those things work within these agencies and really excited to 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 share that so that others can say, you know what, we don't have that here. We need to develop that. How do we do that? And that's, and that's all you can, and, and that's all you can ask for. And like you said, we all don't have it right. And we're still scratching the surface on a lot of these issues. Right. But to see it, see a, um, a, a department at least taking the steps forward. Right. To 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 try right? Maybe five, 10 years, we'll perfect it down the road, but at least to try, let's be progressive and not stick, you know, back in the seventies or the, right. or the eighties, you know, we're moving backwards. Let's keep moving forward. Um, yep. Conrad, I did have another question for you when we were talking about <clears throat> the post-traumatic stress and the firefighters that don't sleep, mm -hmm. right? They're not getting the, the, the proper REM sleep. And then we talk about the, the, the life expectancy after retirement. Have you found a lot of health issues within these guys that are battling post-traumatic stress? On top of the stress, cardiovascular, lung problems, headaches, migraines, all these different things that affect the organs within the body. Absolutely. I mean, those when you when you go without sleep and when you put your body through those kind of stressors and for fire fires especially, you know, they're going into toxic environments and it, it's well documented and well known that, you know, cancer is a huge problem in the fire community. And so, you know, having a healthy lifestyle and promoting a healthy lifestyle is, is going to put you way down the road and having a longer life expectancy, uh, you know, no matter what the situation that you face. And, and some of us, you know, have been blessed with good genes and have a little better, uh, running start than others, but I think if we can if we can help agencies create this culture of wellness that where you take seriously your mental health, your physical health, your emotional health, you know all the all the areas, spiritual health, all the things, you're going to have a more better rounded person to provide services for your community. And for me as a citizen, I want healthy people showing up on my door yeah. when I'm calling nine one one. Right, absolutely, right. Yeah. absolutely, and 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 sometimes it takes uh, takes getting rid of a lot of junk, which leads us right into our next sponsor. So we will be right back. Every business needs a dependable junk hauling service to keep their property clutter free. Call 630-470-8307. Junk Luggers offers a wide range of eco-friendly residential and commercial junk removal services to help your business run smoothly and efficiently. Book your no-obligation estimate with Junk Luggers today. Banks and credit unions have unique junk, and Junk Luggers knows the business. Professional organizers, senior living communities, we're helping everyone clean up and start new. If you're redecorating, remodeling, or getting ready for new tenants, Junk Luggers will donate, recycle, and do our best to keep it out of the landfill. Call 630-470-8307. That's 630-470-8307 today. All right, we are that was, back. With that, was a perfect, that was a perfect segue. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, you know, it is, it is sometimes you just got to throw some stuff away. Uh, declutter yourself, declutter your house, declutter your office, whatever it is. Declutter your um, mind. I'm, I'm glad I could help with that, with that segue. Um, and you know what? Here's another segue for you. <laughs> Next <laughs> summer, I'm going to declutter my mind with an amazing way to deliver this film to the world. Can I talk well, about absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yes. Yes. So I have for many, many years, I have been wanting to do a cross country bike trip. Yes. On a pedal bicycle, human powered from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean. Well, the time has come. And so next summer, starting in mid-May, a friend and I are going to, 
Astoria, Oregon, and we are doing a film and bike tour across the country. So we are going to be pedaling from Astoria, Oregon to Ocean City, Maryland, bringing the film, the PTSD 911, to communities along the route. We're hoping to, to have firehouses open their doors because we know they have bunks, they have food, they have showers, they have all that stuff that we will need. And if they put us up for the night, we'll give them a free screening event for their firehouse and for their community. And then we're also going to plan larger screening events in some of the larger communities along the way. And so it's going to declutter my mind by being out on the open road and pedaling. But then we're going to bring the film to communities along the route, and we cannot wait. It's going to be so well, exciting. Let me ask you something. And I, I may be, may be uh, doing a little knee-jerk reaction here. How long do you think that will take for you to do the whole ride? Yeah, so it, it will take approximately two months. So that's kind of anywhere between 40 and 60 days, depending on how fast we pedal. And if we have support, so we were working on some things behind the scenes that we may have a support team. And if we do, that's going to speed us up quite a bit because we don't have to carry all our, all our own stuff. Well, so when you have the support team, when and hey, uh, if anybody listening has access to an RV or anything, maybe it's it's not a matter of speed. I think maybe it's a matter of hitting up more cities making the film more readily available because not only is this a movie for our first responder community to help understand PTS and ourselves, right? How we function in it, but it's also opening the eyes of the community because we're in a big time crossroads here. I'm not trying to open a, open a can at, at this late stage in the show here, but we, we've got a big can with the defunding the police and the anti-police sentiment across. Uh, what we've got to do is we've got to allow this movie to bridge that gap. Yeah, to absolutely. Bring us together, and that's so actually going, yeah. part of what so, we will hope to bravo, do. Bravo! I think I, now you're going from is, Oregon, right? Uh, yes, from Oregon. Incredible. And then you coming? Are you coming through Texas at any point? No, coming, we're not coming that far south. Uh, we are coming. We're going to kind of stay across. northern across Wyoming, Nebraska, and parts east that way. Okay. So, I know Sam's so going to kill me for this, <laughs> but just like you said, you're going to find a support network. Yep. All right, whatever is directly above Texas. Yeah. Okay. Three states, whatever. <laughs> Nebraska. It is. Uh, Nebraska. Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah, whatever. Oklahoma, whatever it is. <laughs> okay. I would like to offer a badge of honor. Right. We we will support you for a week or two through your journey on us. We will be lead car or or backup car, whatever you guys need for your protection. I'm having on. chill bumps. That's awesome. <laughs> I got chill <laughs> bumps on my arms. <laughs> what do you think, Sam? I know I, I'm, yeah, I'm throwing you know, you know, we've got, uh, it is about the building that support network. Yes. Um, you've got uh, like Lighthouse in NAMI, North Texas, um, that support, but you guys are going to need support uh, for you when you do your, your, your trip. And so here's the thing um, I haven't talked about yes. on, on our trip. We are going to yeah. be actually raising money along the way for first responders. And we're going to oh, donate fantastic. that fund to organizations that support first responders. And at the end of the ride, we have two really nice bikes that we're getting. We're having a conversation with a big bike company now that may give us some bikes. Once we get done with the ride, we're going to donate those two bikes to first responders. Nice. And so oh, it's, it's going to be kind of a, it's a win-win for everybody. But back to your point about the communities, we want to have these community events to bring the communities together. We want, we want to make a big splash as we come into town, maybe have a, an escort of fire and police vehicles. And people say, what, what the heck's going on? Hey, we're showing a movie tonight at the city park. we got a big blow up screen, come out to the city park, have this movie event about first responders. And so that we can help teach the general public about what first responders do and what they experience. But well, we would love to help you escort some of that into some of your cities and towns. So you can count, probably count on me and Sam uh, giving you our full support and a badge of honor, giving up your full, our full support with you. Just let us know the itinerary, the cities, 
and we'll be there for you. Well, yeah, thank so you so much. What you're doing. We're working right now to make the itinerary and get the schedule down, and we'll let make that public as soon as we can. Well, that's awesome. awesome. And uh, I, again, everybody will be able to go to the website to get all the details. I know you are on Facebook, on all the social media channels. So uh, the best way to start is to go to PTSD911movie.com. For those of you that are listening and not watching, that's ptsd 911 movie.com. And uh, for those of you guys that are seeing it right on the screen, stay, this is, this is like home base. This yep. is where everything is going to emanate from. So of course, connect with Conrad and the, the movie and the community uh, on Facebook. You're on Instagram uh, on uh, you. They can connect with you Conrad directly on uh, Twitter and LinkedIn. Yep. So if you guys are, if you guys operate in, the, in those spaces, but again, home base PTSD 911 movie.com. Uh, and uh, for anybody listening that wants to um, help sponsor um, and bring this, uh, this, what are we calling it? A, a tour de, tour de PTSD tour de. 911. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, <I guess>. <laughs> Something <laughs> like that. We haven't landed on the official name yet, but we're working on there that. There we go. <laughs> Yeah, don't call it that. I, no, just, no. <laughs> and, and definitely don't use Sam's movements like a tour. <laughs> well, you know, it's that it's it that flowing across the, the the smooth ride effect. Some so, of it's gonna be like this though, you know, <laughs> up and down. Yes, let it be like this, not like this. Yeah. Uh, Conrad, one we, thank you so much. Wait, one, for, thing, one thing I do want to ask about your tour, and if you're gonna allow, because you know, walk for the red. Um, over up in uh, Michigan, they do this for firefighter cancer. And when they do the walk, they walk 140 miles. Um, but a lot of people join their, join the walk. Will people be allowed to join you in your bicycle run if you had people coming up and, and ride with you? If they want to join us for the run, we'll, we'll be posting. You'll be able to track us live on our website, wherever we are. So, yes, please, please. Perfect. We're making some plans Perfect. to have some uh, semi-YouTube celebrities join us as well. So. Awesome. Right. Awesome. Yeah. That is great. Well, Conrad, thank you so much for yes. joining us uh, this evening. Thank you for blessing the first responder community with this project. We, yes. we know we've, we've been following it since the very beginning, since you launched. Um, you're not a stranger to the first responder community. This movie, it's about you embracing all of us. And we so appreciate it from the bottom of our hearts. Thank yes. you. Um, and yes, Two thumbs up for bringing it to Texas and premiering it here first. Thank you so much. Well, thank um, you. We'll be there for sure. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on the show. And you have a VIP ticket to come to the show or well, to come to the premiere. We're going so. to promote it. You just let us know. Get us some flyers. We'll put them in every precinct, <laughs> yep. every firehouse, everywhere we can put them up, tack them up. All right. We'll do that. Awesome. Thank you. All Conrad, right. We'll be in touch. Okay. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Yep. All bye -bye. right. Bye-bye. Wow. I, I mean, I'm, I'm excited. I am pumped. I'm like, let's go tomorrow. Yeah. You guys, you got to wait till November 3rd. Okay. <laughs> uh, if you're in North Texas, look, if you're, you're within an hour of Irving, you want to make this drive. Um, this will open up so many avenues of understanding and, and that's what it's all about. And uh, like I said, Conrad, we, we've, we've known each other uh, for a long time, we've been part of some of the, the same circles. And so if you are put November 3rd on your, on your calendar, PTSD 911, uh, movie.com to get your tickets, uh, a badge of honor.com. We'll be putting it on our website as well. Um, because there's so much, there's always more to come. This is going to be a huge catalyst and, Yep. Understanding post-traumatic stress, I don't, under, I don't, being aware of how it can affect you, building resiliency, building that wellness piece. That's what we do. We do it in partnership with a lot of folks like Conrad. Um, so you can visit our website, abadgeofhonor.com, and uh, find out more about how to support yourself. Um, and if you're in need because there is no shame, okay? Hit us up. Our, connect, our, our direct contact is right there. 
if you want to jump forward right into getting help, your department doesn't have to know. I'm just, yep. you know, confidential help. That's what it's about. That's what we'll we're about. You, we'll you can you click there. on any of, yeah, any of the partners. And there's no reason for you to go at this alone. We are right there. Um, and we have November 11th, which is Veterans Day. November 11th, we are out at Garland Police Department, our eight-hour workshop. Again, if you're law enforcement, it's eight hours of T-Cole. We've got you covered from breakfast to lunch, everywhere in between, um, again, with that credit. So uh, visit badgeofhonor.com. You can see all about the workshop, and you can register um, right there. And you know what else, John? It's about not being alone. Um, again, September is Suicide Prevention Month. And there's no better way to boost your yourself and to be with people that get you and the struggle that you're going through. Walkthebridge.org, the 22nd of every month. Again, it's about bringing awareness to uh, post-traumatic stress, to suicide in our veteran and first responder communities. You are not alone. See, we wear these shirts for a reason to to let you know that that you truly are not alone um and you don't have to do this battle alone and so come on out the 22nd of every month we are international with walk the bridge so visit walkthebridge.org you can, you can see and take uh part in wherever you are um and if you want to start your own even more important to reach out because you'll get to talk to John right here. My, or I guess I should point this way. <laughs> my, <laughs> my partner right here to, uh, to start your own, uh, a walk the bridge. And, we got, um, we yeah. have two big bridge walks starting this month. We have, uh, Chicago, Chicago mm -hmm. land. Rebecca is starting that one in Chicago and we have Singapore, which is starting. And that goes on. Those are on top of our, our, our Rockwall, Fort Worth, Missouri, England, uh, London, England, um, Montana, and Florida. So there are plenty of bit bridge walks throughout our nation, uh, throughout the globe, and they, and they just keep growing because everybody is seeing a need for this. Um, the one thing I did want to say about um, post uh, the PTSD 911 movie uh, Sam, and you brought up a good point, and that kind of went out of my head, but um, I, I guess I'll think about it and talk about it next week. <laughs> okay. Well, with that, we want to say thank you for joining us. To all of our first responders out there, we're praying for you every day. Thank you for keeping us safe right here at home in our communities. To all the veterans and our active personnel, thank you for guarding our shores. Thank you for putting the F back in the word freedom uh, freedom isn't free. And if it wasn't for you, we couldn't do shows just like this. So until next week, everybody, this is John and Sam with a badge of honor podcast. Have a great night. Take care, Sam. We hear you. We hear you. A badge of honor podcast is produced for the OBBM network podcast and protected under copyright law for content permissions. Please submit your request to a badge of honor.com on the content page. For OBBM Network programming information, please call 214-714-0495 today.